Good morning, everyone. Um, my presentation today is somewhat of a continuation of last week's. So last week I talked about time, and I had repurposed a presentation I did several years ago. Um, when I created the presentation, I had forgotten that I did it in the style of a Pecha Kucha presentation. So pres Pecha Kucha, if you don't know, it's a style of, it's a format of presenting information. Um, so they say 20 images or 20 slides in 20 seconds. So in PowerPoint, you can set up the settings so that these slides automatically advance uh, within whatever time frame you want. Typically, this format is 20 seconds. And it was created by some designers and architects in Japan several years ago, I want to say 2003. Um, as a way of getting more information together and more um, uh, productive get-togethers of different architects and designers. Um, they say, and I felt it's true if you give a, especially architects it seems like, but definitely engineers as well, a platform and a microphone they can just drone on for hours. So this is a way to keep people on topic. Well, last week, um, my presentation, I, I actually had deleted a lot of the slides, and I, as I mentioned, had forgotten that I had set up the auto fast forward. And so when I was giving the presentation, we were already a little bit over time, um, and I was a little verklempt, as it were, because I forgot that the slides were advancing ahead of me, and I didn't have time to stop the settings, so I just went with it. And I threw out a lot of information, um, as I am apt to do. But some of the points that I wanted to make, I, I was too flustered to be able to complete them. The main one is that uh, time, in essence, is our fourth dimension. Time stops for no one. So we're all familiar with 3D. And as we start talking about science and advanced topics like that, time is very critical. It is quite the physical constant that um, whether we like it or not, we'll always just continue. So my topic for today, holding on for a second, is just to take a moment to think about time and what that means in our lives. If you had an opportunity to watch the Cosmos series last Sunday, um, which continues for the next couple weeks, I hope you continue watching it, you may have seen this um, metaphor of sorts that was used by, originally by Carl Sagan to explain time. So this cosmic calendar, if we can imagine that um, New Year being the Big Bang and currently where we are being New Year's Eve, so one year of the whole entirety of the universe, if we could fit that onto a calendar, then what that would really mean is that we came on board essentially in the, the last hour of uh, existence. So Jesus, if you can think of it in that time frame, was, would have been born five seconds ago, with each day counting as 40 million years. Of course, that, that's assuming that you subscribe to um, the Big Bang Theory and evolution and that every day is indeed 40 million years and not just a single day as we encounter it. So this idea that we've only really been around for a very short period of time in, in terms of the complexity of the universe. Um, and for that matter, we've only really begun to explore and to try to understand the universe around us. It's frankly very daunting, but at the same time, the fact that we can do it is incredible. And of course, one of the reasons we can even begin to explore the heavens and to send out spaceships into them is uh, as a result of Sir Isaac Newton, just some one who is incredibly connected to the cosmos as no one else really has ever been. Um, a couple stories that I found very interesting about Mr. Newton is that he uh, took Galileo's uh, hypothesis of the Earth circling the Sun and why it was an ellipse, and he you know, mathematically showed that it was possible. Well, his good friend said, okay, I, I get that, but why is it an ellipse? Why not a circle or a square or any other f fancy shape like a star or something like that? And Newton said, mm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, let me get back to you. And as it turns out at that time, he uh, was living in London being a student and uh, the plague broke out. So not only was he able to take time off to escape the plague and go into the countryside, he was productive with his time away from others um, in that he invented calculus to be able to show that the, the reasoning for the orbits to be elliptical was in fact very true and real, but in order for him to explain that, he had to 
create the system of math that we now employ for so many things. Now, what I found interesting about that is, you know, what a genius, of course, that he had to create calculus to be able to explain this answer to a question that seemingly would have been easy. But the fact that he um, was able to just allocate so much of his brain power into these questions that nobody else would have really, you know, bothered to go that deep into. And uh, whether or not this is appropriate, but gives you a sense of what he spent his time on, um, he, he lived for a long time, and at the, in fact, he never really had lasting relationships with other individuals in terms of being, an, you know, an intimate partner. So he died a virgin. It's uh, said that he was also not too keen on uh, personal hygiene. So all of those hours spent on very fruitful labors, um, not necessarily very social animal in that respect. So you may be familiar with this concept of the 10,000 hours that it takes to become proficient in any subject area. It's very true, you know, that the question of how do you get to Carnegie Hall, practice, whatever it is that you take the time to, to put into uh, whatever efforts that you decide, you know, it does build up. And there's a, another famous quote by Einstein who said, you know, even though I'm not well, he was very brilliant. He, he recognized that, but he said, it's not so much that I'm smarter than everyone else, it's that I've spent more time thinking about these things than anyone else has had, you know, the effort to do. As you know, he, he worked in a post office, uh, or a patent office, rather, and he was, um, he had a lot of busy work, but he also had a lot of downtime that he was able to think about concepts such as relativity and other aspects of the universe. So maybe your job is not so exciting and maybe you wish you could be doing something else. But that's really up to you is how you end up spending your time. And sometimes it's not so easy, but as you start moving forward towards your dreams, um, it, it really will depend on how you focus your energies every day. And with that, I'm going to share with you a story. Um, the only real way that I know how to stop time, frankly, is um, eating this really amazing fruit. Uh, recently came out and came on board called the Sumo Orange. And with that, I'm going to play for you a little clip that may illustrate um, the really awesome power and how it came to be, the Sumo Orange taking 30 years to reach us here in the United States. So with that, I hope this works okay. Walk around the farmer's market and you'll frequently see David Karp. He's a pomologist, or fruit scientist, and he writes the Market Watch column for the LA Times. Today he's with me in the studio with the story of a new citrus variety. There's a particular variety that I've been following for 12 years and holding back, it's just driven, driven me crazy because in my opinion, it's the most delicious citrus in the world. That is a really bold statement. Well, I've tasted over a thousand varieties and I'm convinced that this is the case. And it's not just me. I was traveling recently in China. I visited the Beibei collection uh, near Chongqing, and the curator, I asked him, what's the most delicious citrus among the 1,200 varieties that you have here? And he looked at me like I was asking him, what's the capital of China? He, he said to me, Chiranui, you fool. It looks like a really kind of nubby tangelo. It does, because it has a bump at the top like a miniola tangelo, but it's lighter in color with a rougher, more pebbly skin. This fruit peels very, very easily. I mean, you could peel it all in one in one motion practically, completely seedless. The membranes surrounding the segments are gossamer thin. And the flesh is both firm when you first bite into it, but it melts in your mouth. And then the flavor, that's the thing that's just the killer. It's like a giant tangerine, the way it opens. Well, that's what it is. It's three quarters tangerine or, or mandarin, botanically, and one quarter orange. So it's a tangelo. When I first tasted this five years ago, I thought that my refractometer, a device for measuring sweetness, was broken because it was 20, and nothing is 20. That's like if you saw somebody who was nine feet tall. And when a fruit, when a citrus fruit is 20, it's like almost as sweet as a date, but also high in acidity that counterbalances it, so it's not just insipidly sweet. And there's an intense, intense aroma. Okay, so what are we calling this fruit? Well, it's being marketed as sumo, <laughs> but in deference to its homely appearance, as many consider it, and to its uh, prodigious size, because they can be big. They range in size from basically a modest navel orange size to a fairly big grapefruit. Where are they being grown? They're being grown in the San Joaquin Valley from um, basically in the, in the citrus belt near Visalia, 
Lindsay, Porterville area is where they're mostly concentrated. There's 430 acres, which is a lot. And and are the growers anybody that w whose name we would recognize from the markets? No, the consor it's a consortium organized by SunTree, which is owned by the Griffith family. You won't see it. That was a good question you're asking. Can we find this at, at farmers markets? Absolutely not. Uh, at least no legal fruits. The reason for this is this up variety was bred in Japan in 1972. It was released as a public variety. Nobody paid any attention to it till about the 1990s when the Japanese caught on that it had such intense flavor and it became the most prized and sought after and expensive fruit, ranging from two to up to ten dollars for a uh, for a single fruit. Um, there was a fellow who imported the budwood. You, you just can't bring in any old budwood from citrus around the world. That would be strictly illegal. What does budwood mean? That is a stem for grafting onto rootstock for propagating a variety that's true to type and a whole orchard ultimately. So when you bring in this budwood, it has to go through the California Citrus Clonal Protection Program. These guys did it, Brad Stark Jr. and his family. I learned about this in 1998, just as the Christmas freeze of 98 was setting in. And that proud old company, Stark Packing, was driven out of business. The rights to this variety then, such as they were, passed to a fellow, well, the, the but was, was in the possession of, of a fellow named John Fisher. Anyway, it was a long, convoluted trail. He wouldn't talk to me. Nobody would talk to me. Finally, I got a call in the middle of the night from this guy, Roger Smith from Tree Source Nursery, a good friend and very knowledgeable uh, and distinguished citrus nurseryman. And he said, as his voice was dead serious like this, it's like something out of a Raymond Chandler novel. David, I'm not happy that you found out about the Decapon because that's its market in Japan. He said, there's some heavy hitters that are deeply involved in this, and they're not happy that you know about it. If you know what's good for you, I'd keep quiet about it. Now, why is that? Why is there so much secrecy? Well, this is what it is, as I later found out. To unravel the story was the work of a dozen years. What he was afraid of was he, they didn't actually own the rights. In this case, possession of the budwood was nine-tenths of the law. They had it, but if somebody else had found out how excellent this variety is, they could have gone to Japan, brought in the budwood themselves, and gotten a head start on actually growing it. As it is now, the University of California Colonial Protection Program has already brought in the budwood from Florida, where nobody's interested in it for various reasons. But it'll be another three years before that's released, and another seven years from now before you taste it from the competitor to Suntry. And as the head of their consortium, Michael George, the general manager of Suntry, said, that's fine with me. I'm cool with, with that. I'm just tickled that we've been able to keep it secret for as long as we have. So in a way, it's like when a drug first comes out to the market and it's a proprietary formulation and they have they can just make bank until the patent runs out and generics can come on the market. Yes, yeah, so this is a little different. Many fruit varieties are patented. Here, the key was that it wasn't patented, that it's just knowledge and possession of the budwood. So what does that mean? If somebody, for example, were to steal into one of their orchards, and they're probably pretty sure that somebody is going to do that, especially now that my articles come out in a sort of public knowledge, um, and were to start propagating it and start selling that fruit, they would go to them or they would have the phytosanitary authorities go to that variety pirate and say, hey, where did you get your budwood? Because you actually have to have a registered tree from a reg an acknowledged source that's been disease tested here in California. And this is not just somebody, some bureaucrat being persnickety. Look what we're facing with one lung thing and other citrus diseases that cause billions of dollars in damage in Florida and threaten to devastate that iconic crop here in California. There's only a small crop now because even though there's 430 acres, not all of them are bearing and they're very young trees. That's the other thing about this variety is that the trees bear like gangbusters. It almost looks like they're going to bear themselves into an early grave and they bear young and prodigiously. And, and plus their post harvest of the fruit is very good. They keep and storage for, for months. And that's what the Japanese actually do so that the acidity settles down. So the combination of fantastic flavor, great production, and post-harvest is a trifecta that's rarely if ever found in citrus or in any fruit. So this is the god fruit. <laughs> the god fruit. I had, there's been some serious... So I hope you can hear me. I'm just pausing that audio. Um, it continues for quite a while, and it talks more about this controversy of how this fruit came to our shores. Um, but in any case, uh, this is incredibly amazing fruit. As I mentioned, it is one way that I know of to stop time to take a moment to just appreciate flavor and what God has given to us. 
So with that, uh, I don't have a recipe for you today. Um, I spent quite a bit of time of my week uh, working very hard on my deadlines and uh, also celebrating Pi Day, which happened last Friday. So I made a, a sumo citrus key lime sort of pie, but instead of limes, I used the sumo orange juice, and it was quite tasty. So I hope you maybe give it a try if you like making pies, um, make it with the sumo juice, or just go get one. There's very limited time left. They're almost out of season. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Derek, um, and hopefully you found my presentation interesting. I'm still trying to think of what that all means and how it ties back into my life, but just take a moment to enjoy the fruits of your labor for this weekend, as well as some delicious fruit. Thanks, everyone.